Planning Commission public meeting held at the New York City Planning Commission hearing room in the lower concourse of 120 Broadway. Today is Wednesday, January 8th, 2020. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and electronic devices. All persons wishing to speak should fill out a speaker's card at the desk in the lobby. In addition, we ask that those speaking, please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago. Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Bernie. Commissioner Capelli. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. Commissioner De La Uz. Here. Commissioner Dweck. Here. Commissioner Eady. Commissioner Knight. Here. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marin. Tees. Here. Commissioner Rampashad. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes in the, of the public hearing of Wednesday, December 18th, 2019. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The minutes are adopted. Scheduling. Calendars numbers 1 through 8. We have resolutions for adoption scheduling Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020, for a public hearing to be held at the New York City Planning Commission hearing room, lower concourse of 120 Broadway. On the resolutions, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page 16. Reports, uh, calendar number nine in the borough of the Bronx, Community District 4, ULIP number C190508 MMX, in the matter of an application for an amendment to the city map concerning Bridge Park South mapping. For a favorable report on calendar number nine, Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Uz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner, Mar Commissioner Ortiz. Commissioner Rampashad, yes. a fair report has been adopted on calendar number nine. No. Calendar number 10, Borough of Queens, Community District 7, ULIP number C190320 ZSQ, in the matter of an application for the grant of a special permit concerning 18 17 130th Street, College Point. Special College Point District. For a favorable report on calendar number 10, Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Com Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Uz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 10. Calendar number 11, Borough of Queens, Community District 7, ULIP number C190029 ZMQ, in the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning 147-40 15th Avenue commercial overlay rezoning. For a favorable report on calendar number 11, Chair Lago. Yes. Co Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Commission Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Uz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampershaw. Yes. A favor report has been adopted on calendar number 11. Calendar numbers 12 and 13, Borough of Queens Community District 12. Calendar number 12, C190267 ZMQ. Calendar number 13N190266 ZRQ. In the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 22 60 46th Street rezoning. For favor reports on calendar <coughs> numbers 12 and 13, Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Uz. I'm going to uh, split my vote on this. First, on the on the action, uh, the N190266ZRQ, I'm going to vote yes on that. On the mapping action for MIH, I'm going to abstain. While I uh, support um, mapping MIH, I'm concerned about mapping option two with the workforce option. Um, I don't think it's appropriate. 50% <coughs> of this community board um, is at 60% of AMI and below. Um, and the greatest need uh, would be, at the very least, uh, to map options one and two. So with that, I'm going to abstain on that action. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Um, I am in full agreement with Commissioner Deleuze here, and I'll split my vote in the same way. So uh, yes on one and abstain on the other. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. 
Ferry reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 12 and 13. Borough of Staten Island, calendar numbers 14 through 17, through Community District 3, calendar number 14, C180308 ZSR, calendar number 15, N180309 RAR, calendar number 16, N180310 RAR, calendar number 17, N180311 RAR, and the manner of applications for the grant of a special permit and for the grant of authorizations <laughs> concerning two 835 and 2845 Veterans Road Rest, West for a favorable report on calendar number 14 and for adoption on calendar numbers 15, 16, and 17, Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Uz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner, e uh, Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampershaw. Yes. A fair report has been adopted on calendar number 14 and calendar numbers 15 through 17 have been adopted. Uh, on calendar numbers 18 through 26 concerning the borough of Staten Island, uh, Bedell Avenue, Everton Avenue, Lamont Avenue, Sheldon Avenue, and 70 Wait, and 74 seated yeah. terrace have been laid over. Yeah. Nope. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 28. Borough of, the, Borough of the Bronx, calendar numbers 27 and 28 in Community District 6, calendar number 27, C190087 MMX, calendar number 28, C190043 MMX, uh, a public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map amendments concerning East 175th Street and East 180th Street bridge rehabilitations. Our first speaker will be Cameron Sikander, and he will be joined also from the City Department of Transportation by Ferdinand John, who's available for questions. Actually, it's the opposite. Um, I think at the front, they made a little error, so <laughs> Ferdinand John that is the one doing the speaking. All right, my Thank name you. is Ferdinand John. I'm, from, I'm the director for Inno Design Section over the Division of Bridges. Um, our contract actually consists of three different projects, 180F, 175th, and 169th Street Bridges over Metro North. But for the ULAB application, we only have uh, 180F and 175th over Metro North. All three bridges were built about 130 years ago. Uh, they're about 60 feet long, and they span uh, four active tracks over the Metro North Railroad. For 175th, the, uh, the, the scope of work we're doing for the construction, we're going to replace the deck completely over the, over the railroad. We're also going to reconstruct the approaches at the intersections with Park Avenue East and Park Avenue West. Once we're done with this project, <clears throat> we'll have a brand new roadway um, within the project limits. We also have brand new sidewalks, curves, pedestrian ramps, uh, street lights. We also have new bridge railing, new fencing, and it will be striped uh, within the project limits. 180F Street Bridge over Metro North Railroad. The scope of work is very similar to 175. Whatever I said a while ago will be the exact same thing. The only difference between the significant difference between 180 and 175 is the amount of utilities that are under the roadway and under the bridge of uh, 180F Street Bridge. So I'm gonna go to the next slide and all these lines uh, that you see, the blue and green and orange, different lines, these are all different utilities. We have two 30-inch uh, water main going across the bridge. We have one 12-inch water main also. Uh, Verizon ECS has a number of uh, conduits uh, across the bridge and in, at the intersections also. Same thing with Corn Edison, they have a lot of electrical conduits and also a gas bin. Uh, so all of this uh, is actually going to create a, a big challenge for the contractor. As a matter of fact, both ECS and, and Cornison requested that some of the, of, the, of the conduits be held in place during the construction. This, this slide is basically, uh, if you were to take a ride on the, on the, on the Metro North, at the front uh, car of the Metro North Railroad, the top uh, picture is what it looks like right now as you approach the bridge. Uh, with the railing, green railing right now, and the fencing. Uh, at the bottom uh, picture, you'll see what it will look like after we are done. 
uh, new, new railing, new fencing, uh, new deck, new support for the deck. So the blue, the heavy blue um, section would be the deck, and the gray below it would be support for that deck. All of this will be brand new. <clears throat> uh, the support system. Thank you, yeah. Mr. John. Questions? Yes, Commissioner Capelli. Uh, Cerullo, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, just given the location of this work, is there and and the extent to which utilities are? Oh. It was on. Sorry, I turned it off. Um, thank you. I, I'm just wondering what impact, if any, is expected, given the utility involvement here, to potential customers during the work? And two, will there be any impact at any point in time on Metro North service, given the fact that at some point you're over the train tracks? And what, what coordination is being organized with Metro North? Okay, as far as the customers, I mean, there will always be traffic uh, allowed on the bridge during construction because we're going to build this, this uh, reconstruct this work in stages. Mm -hmm. So there will always be uh, vehicle traffic and also pedestrian traffic at all times. Um, as far as Metro North is concerned, we'll be doing a lot. They, they give us a window, uh, nighttime window, I think, three or four hour window for the contractor to be able to do their work at nighttime. So anything, anything that has to be done that's not going to affect them can be done during the daytime, but anything that's going to be affecting the tracks will be within the window that uh, Metronov gave us. So that's already been considered, uh, and you've, you're working with them on a schedule. For, yes, for yes, that. definitely, yeah. And we're also going to have a community liaison involved in this project that's going to handle all the coordination with the Metronov and with the you know traffic around and the community around. Okay, that's great. I, I, I'm, I mean, I appreciate that, and I, I think that's the way to go. Um, and I understand the potential traffic implications, but uh, I was just wondering if there would be a point, and perhaps the community coordinator would will be involved in this in dealing with the surrounding neighborhood, if there's you know water shutoff or power shutoffs at any point in time that could impact their their day to day, and how that information gets relay to the community in time for them to be prepared for it. That's why for a project like that, we typically um, involve community liaison. They have to be part of that project. So anything that comes up, you know, we'll be reaching out. The contractor will reach out to the community liaison and Great. make sure that they can reach out to the community. Thank you. Yep. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Uh, I just want to follow up on, on that line of questioning. Um, are you going to undertake the uh, the reconstruction of the two bridges simultaneously, or will they be uh, sequenced? Well, I, I, like I said, uh, it's actually three projects. 169 is also a third one right. you know, in addition. So the contractor, we, ex we intend to give the contractor notice to proceed uh, you know, by August of this year. And uh, we're gonna, when we give notice to proceed, it'll be for all three projects simultaneously. So by, um, for the, the, the one that you have three bridges is the one that's gonna take the longest, we say about 29 months. So by 29 months from August uh, of this year, 29 months after, they should finish all three projects, yes. So he'll be working on all three projects simultaneously. For 175th and 180th, what are the uh, projected time frames for each of those uh, projects? Okay, 175th, we say in 25 months to finish it up. And uh, for 180, we say 29 months, 29 months. Okay. All starting from August of 2020. Commissioner Delahousse. So uh, we started this conversation by saying that the, the bridges have been there for 130 years. What's the useful life of the new bridges? Um, typically, uh, this one, I think, 50 years. 50? Years. Yeah. If it's a brand new bridge where, we move, where we're going to replace the abutment, the supports, it's typically 75 years. But since we're removing the deck but keeping the support, 50 years. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Rumpershot. In terms of logistics, you're going to use how many cranes? Because there's a lot of structural members you're going to install. So, and how many members can you put in during that four-hour gap that you have? That's, that's going to be up on, to the contractor. I mean, we're designers. We don't, you know, that's going to be handled by the contractor. I won't be able to answer that question. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. John. All right, thank you. So that is our only speaker. If anyone who is here would want to be heard on this item, please come forward. 
Okay, the public hearing is closed. Calendar number 29, Borough of the Bronx, Community District 10, ULIP number C, 200088ZMX, a public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning the C7 Bay Chester Avenue rezoning. Our first speaker will be Council Member Andy King, and we will follow our practice of not placing a time limit on the testimony of our elected officials. Good morning. Good morning. And I say good and plenty for 2020. <laughs> I wish everyone well, and them and their families. Um, I'm New York City Council Member Andy King. I represent the 12th District of the Bronx. I'm glad to be here today to lend my voice as well as support the residents in Co-op City in regards to its patch of area in that neighborhood that has been one of contentious conversations and problems and challenges for us all um, going back a couple of years when we came here before to denounce and fight against the erection of a huge huge signage that would have a devastating effect on the residents who live in the houses there and the, the apartment buildings as well. So to that, to that effect, um, last Monday, uh, a couple of Mondays ago, we had a devastating accident that occurred from a pole that fell down, a wind turbine that was built on the same location that came crashing down. Ironically enough, it was knocked down by the wind. We're trying to figure out how a wind turbine gets knocked down by wind when it's designed to capture the wind to create energy energy to service residents, uh, and we still have not been able to determine by the owner who was this energy designed for, because they never had a conversation with the community about what they were building. So yes, we're grateful and thankful that no children got injured, because that is the hub of that neighborhood, right next to a school educational complex from Truman High School, MS-180, and a few other um, specialized schools that are there. So we're very concerned, because that pole is still erecting there in this, in this same location, and we're fearful that we we don't know how strong it is. One day, a good, another wind could come down and knock it down. So part of the community conversation is how do we are able to remove these two poles? Well, having a conversation, we're understanding this rezoning, that's part of this ULA process, still, still wants to keep the poles up um, and just saying that it should be at a, a level that's close enough to the highway that meets the same length. So while they've measured it at this point that the sign is 291 feet, that they're saying that any signage that continues to move forward should be at the same level of that height. Currently, the poles that are up there are, we don't even know how high they are, but they looked about 20 stories high. On which, which, which is an eyesore, but let alone, it's scary for all of us each and every day when we walk past or drive past this particular neighborhood. So it gives me um, uh, some dismay that um, the Department of Buildings have said, um, how do we remove this structure? Well, in the City Council, I've asked for a tax amendment to have these structures removed, but uh, according to a report that I got back from um, this application that they did not want to move forward with that and keeping it a C7, they still wanted to move it into a C8-2 um, zoning. Um, the problem that we still have with that is that it doesn't address the issue of removing these signs and this big monster that still stands on this corner that faces the houses, that faces the, um, the lighting that was in people's um, windows. So it still doesn't address that. So we st I stand here not in support of this zoning that's being asked of today. I'd rather us sit back down with the community again, um, which is not in favor of this zoning, even though Community Board 10 did vote um, 25 to 4 at the time, and that was before the turn by blew down and fell down, and now everybody's in the uproar of how do we remove all this. I would ask um, the commission here, I would ask you all, um, when you're reviewing this application, I would ask you to deny it till we can sit back and really make zoning laws that make sense um, for our communities. Uh, I know businesses have to do business in the city of New York, but according to the rules itself, this particular wind turbine was is designed to generate energy can only be put in an M3 location. Right now, the zoning here is a C7 zone, so right now it violates the law as it is right now. So we don't know how this person was able to even erect this so quickly in a eight and a two-day span, this 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 um, poll went up. And we still not find city council, we're still doing an investigation. DOB said they'll have a report for us in the coming weeks to find out who approved it, how it was able to get up, how it was able to get built in a matter of such a quick notice, quick, in a quick amount of time. And it showed that it was faulty, that it fell within two weeks. 
weeks after it being erected. So I'm asking you all to listen to the pleas and the cries of the residents in Co-op City and Community Board 10, myself along with Senator Bailey as well as Assemblymember Benedetto to do all that we can to make sure before any changes to the zoning in this community and that, in that particular location is really set, having a community input to see what makes sense that what gets actually been placed on this piece of property. Again, I thank you for your time this morning. I thank you for your energy and your commitment to serve New York City. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, I will just note that the pre-existing sign is allowed under the C8, uh, the, under the C7, apologies, um, which is the zoning for amusement parks and under the zoning would allow even additional signs. Under the C8, the signage restrictions are much, much tighter. Separately, we are working with the Department of Buildings on the issue of a wind turbine. This is separate from the sign. And it is our understanding, and we'll have more information at the post-hearing review session, that wind turbines are allowed in C7s and C8s as accessory to buildings, not as standalone energy generators, which are allowed in M3 districts. Um, and so the change from C7 to C8 would have the impact of not allowing a new large sign of the type that is currently there. The, the current large sign is grandfathered, and I believe the council member is talking about methods, potential methods outside of zoning to deal with the current sign. But the issue of the turbine is both terrifying because of what happened, but is unrelated to the zoning action that, that is before us. Questions for the council member? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for coming Thank down here. Much. All right, God bless. Our next speaker is Rod Saunders. Good morning and thank you. My name is Rod Saunders. Uh, good morning. My name is Rod Saunders. I am the second vice president of the River Bay Board of Directors in Co-op City. And I too am in opposition uh, to changing from the current C7 to the C8. Uh, if, if should there be a C8-2, should there be a rezoning, we felt that it should be closer to the C4 uh, district that exists around the perimeters of uh, Co-op City as it extends our commercial shopping districts within Co-op City, as well as the large uh, complex Bay Plaza is a C4-3, I believe. So what we want to do is come down, not go up, because our problem is with the C8 is that the C8, we feel, allows for commercial development that is not necessarily uh, uh, in the best interest of Co-op City residents. Uh, in particular, you know, we have already been uh, uh, granted the uh, uh, an animal shelter uh, to have a C8, you could get something like a crematorium for animals uh, on that on that site. Uh, use group 16, use group 13 through 16 are, are much too high or close to manufacturing districts uh, to have something that close to a residential district. So we object to that. Also, I, I would want to on a procedural note. No one ever can, you know, the board of directors are responsible for uh, representing the 50,000 residents of Co-op City. Uh, this proposal was not brought to the board of directors for discussion. We did not have an opportunity before the October 17th hearing uh, for the community board to hear exactly what the proposal was. We didn't have an opportunity to discuss it. Um, and just one last portion about the sign. The, the sign, my understanding, is the building department had determined that it is within 200, according to the building department, the design is within 250 feet of the arterial highway of I-95. They went, the Board of Standards and Appeals agreed with the Department of Buildings. The owner went to court. The court agreed with the, the uh, Board of Standards and Appeals. That sign, that pole should be taken down. That, that wind turbine was put on top of the pole, not on top of the building, and the pole was extended. That pole right now, the existing pole, is 195 feet. That pole was extended almost another, somewhere between 50 and 100 feet. Uh, the point is that pole doesn't belong there. Again, the Board of Standards and Appeals has ruled against it. The owner went to court. The courts have ruled against it. That, that pole should be taken down. That structure should have never been built in the first place. But as, part, as far as I'm concerned, the Board of, Standards, excuse me, the board of Directors of Co-op City are unanimous in their opposition, and we represent the, the community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saunders. Questions? 
Commissioner Villalobos. So I, I wanna make sure you just said that the, the, the co-op board is in, unanimous against the particular proposal, but then you also said that the actual proposal wasn't brought before the co-op board um, before the October. So you're saying that the co-op board had a chance to discuss it, but it was after the public hearing? That is correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Great, yes. thank you for yes. that. Yes, I'm, okay. I'm sorry, I did not make that point. No, I, I, maybe I just wasn't following it, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Thank you for your testimony. May I make one more comment? No, I'm afraid not. The speakers are limited to three moments. Thank you. But we would always welcome any written testimony that you would want to submit. Thank you very much. Those are the only speakers on this item, but if there are others present who are interested, please come forward. The public hearing is closed. Calendar numbers 30 and 31, Borough of Brooklyn, Community District 8. Calendar number 30, C190256, ZMK. Calendar number 31, N190257, ZRK. A public hearing in the matter of application for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning Grand Avenue and Pacific Streets rezoning. We're going to have a 10 minute team presentation of a team comprised of Richard Lobel, Nick Liberis, and Ellie Parianti. Chair, Commissioners, good morning. Uh, Richard Lobel from Shub and Lobel PC. I'm joined by Ellie Pariente of EMP Capital Group. Nick Labaris is a project architect who I expect will be running in breathlessly in about 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. uh, we're here today to discuss the Grand Avenue and Pacific Street rezoning. So as can be seen from the map, the uh, area is currently zoned M11. Um, this is uh, similar to other rezonings that we've come in for in the area. Specifically, in May 2019, the commission approved rezonings at both 1010 and 1050 Pacific Street. Um, by way of background, those rezonings, which appear on the map in the dotted areas, were for an R7A bulk, uh, alternatively paired with C24 and M14 zoning districts. So the rezoning here differs from that in that this is along Grand Avenue, and so a zoning FAR of 5.6 pursuant to an R7D is requested. This specific rezoning is for an R7D with a C24 overlay. This has the advantage pursuant to um, uh, the resolution of mandating non-residential ground floor uses, specifically in this area, as I'm sure will be discussed, uh, Community Board 8's M Crown Zoning Subcommittee has discussed um, mandated M Crown uses uh, for properties located within this area. And so by zoning standards, this will require such, uh, such square footage. Um, the proposal here would involve roughly on the development site, which is on the north side of Pacific Street, roughly uh, 8,400 square feet total of uh, commercial floor area. So the zoning district boundary extends to the southern portion of the rezoning area as well. You can see uh, roughly uh, four lots and a portion of a fifth lot, lot 13, included with that, within that rezoning area. Uh, the lots right now are primarily vacant. There are um, some uh, F, uh, buildings, two three-story buildings. Um, these are old uh, buildings with existing residential. You can see from the land use map here that there is a strong commercial presence along Grand Avenue. This is uh, what is contemplated both by the rezoning proposal as well as the M Crown proposal that Grand Avenue uh, exists as a commercial corridor. So um, the, re the components right now of the proposal at the development site involve both the ground floor commercial uses as well as the uh, residential uses above. This would, under the current iteration, result in a nine-story building. Uh, the uh, residential units would total 64 with roughly 16 uh, accorded to um, affordable inclusionary units. Here's a copy of the proposed rezoning map. Uh, and as can be seen, uh, first that this is located on the same block as the prior 1010 Pacific Street proposal, which again was approved within the last year. And second, the, um, the existing uh, M11 would be converted to R70 with C24. We would note that this is in an area of roughly eight blocks that is, um, that, uh, is, is zoned M11, a low FAR commercial district with high parking requirements that has resulted largely in um, many underutilized and vacant lots. 
we have pictures of the surrounding area. Um, you can see the uh, utilization of the current lots, which are, which are vacant or used for parking. Um, and then we have a copy of the uh, proposed development plans. Um, you know, obviously these are illustrative, but indicate what the um, developer here would like to um, see in the, uh, for the development going forward. Um, you know, we note that the uh, community board here uh, has voted um, in favor of the application subject to certain conditions. I would not deem to speak for the community board. I know that um, uh, that Ms. Tyus as well as Mr. Vicconi are here to discuss the community board's resolutions. Um, but um, I guess at this point, I would just introduce uh, Nick Liberis, the project architect, merely to discuss um, the bulk uh, layout of the building. And then Ellie can briefly discuss his experience in the area. Uh, hi, Nick Liberis uh, with Arkham Architecture. Uh, the, the first thing that we saw when we came to this site, we were, we were very struck with how, how uh, close this was to the, uh, to the main drag um, on Atlantic. So you can see over here uh, that there's a facade uh, that we've chosen uh, to, uh, to host a very large uh, piece of art on. Uh, the other determining factors for this design, uh, we were uh, we were trying to bring something into the area that um, uh, uh, that wasn't slavishly um, like adherent to all the other um, like development stuff that you see coming up here. Um, so we thought that if we if if uh, we could harken back to like a manufacturing aesthetic uh, with an addition up on top, it, it, it uh, would be something which could be contextual and uh, fit in uh, to the neighborhood. Um, you can see that we have a first floor at the bottom right over here, uh, where we have a full floor retail use, uh, which which could also be uh, divided um, with this M, M crown use, which has been proposed. Uh, then we have about 64 units up on top, of which uh, I think about 25% will be MIH. Uh, you can see the elevation here. We have nine nine stories proposed. Uh, you have the aforementioned base, uh, which is in that manufacturing style, and then you have that big addition up on top, about three three stories. And this is um, a facade detail uh, demonstrating uh, the brickwork which which we'd like to propose for the building. And I'm going to pass this back to Rich. So again, I'd just like to introduce Ali Pariente, uh, who is the representative of the um, applicant, who can just briefly discuss his experience in the M Crown area. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ali Pariente of EMP Capital Group. As Richard just mentioned, um, uh, we've been following the progress of the M Crown rezoning committee for the past two and a half years now. I myself have attended most uh, of the M Crown subcommittee meetings in order to understand fully uh, the vision and you know the mindset that both city planning and the community board were in. Um, and this is basically the, what we use in order to develop our applications. So basically we, um, after witnessing the vision of the community board and city planning over a year and a half, two year period, we started developing this proposal based exactly on the, the vision that both uh, entities had. And that's uh, obviously what we're presenting. I am very you know, supportive of the vision of both community board and city planning. Uh, as I'm sure the community board will testify, I've been vocal in my support of uh, the, the rezoning for the area. I've been, you know, open to accommodating uh, whatever request the um, community board has been having, such as the M crown use on the ground floor. Um, I fully understand, I mean, I understand now the vision that the community board has for these uses on the ground floor and, you know, the vision that the community board, the community board has for this neighborhood going forward. Um, I am excited to be a part of it. I'm excited to start uh, this project. And as uh, Nick just mentioned, we do believe that this um, particular project, even though it's not as that large, uh, would have a significant impact just because of its location vis-a-vis -vis the Atlantic Avenue corridor. As uh, Nick just mentioned, it really would be essentially the first building right off of Atlantic Avenue, uh, right where the M Crown neighborhood starts, uh, just about 30 foot away, 30 feet away from us, um, becomes, you know, begins Prospect Heights. This would essentially be the first building almost uh, to start the M Crown. And because of the proximity to Atlantic Avenue, we really feel like it would sort of like 
be the entrance to the, this M crown uh, neighborhood, which is also partly what we decided to put that uh, large 50 by 60 art f feature, you know, uh, art piece on the. Um, on the side of the building in order to you know be visible to the from the Atlantic Avenue corridor and show some kind of life um, starting this neighborhood uh, we've also cont you know we've also talked to uh, some local artists in order to run some kind of a competition in order to uh, pick which artist will will design that uh, the mural um, and really just just overall in order to sort of like create um, uh, a healthy neighborhood um, feel, um, and um, you know, excited to uh, move forward on this. Anything else? And we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. The one thing I do want to clarify is that the community board vote was not in favor. It was in opposition with conditions. Oh, Chair, I, I'm, I'm happy that uh, obviously the, the representatives are here to discuss their vote. And we have their vote. Questions? Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. Um, I noted that R7D as of right is a, gives you the ability to build up to 110 feet, but your proposal is for nine stories only. Are you willing to memorialize that? Excuse me for a moment. So the, um, the community board resolutions requested three aspects um, in their, in their uh, determination. And so the we're, what we what we seek to memorialize, and, and there's actually, again, they can speak to this, but there's already been a community benefits agreement which has been forwarded to us for our review, is to memorialize the M Crown uses. The applicant, um, the applicant currently has proposed a building which is nine stories. Um, the uh, the applicant, but the, that building is at nine stories and at a height of, I believe, it's between 100 and 105 feet. So. Um, what we'd like to do is to have the same height as is proposed with the option of putting in an additional story. So we wouldn't exceed the current proposal, but we may, we just have the optionality of, to the extent that the commercial uh, ground floor would change in height, that we'd have the option of changing the, the number of stories. So while that, th while we have no issue with, um, with, with memorializing that, uh, we do have that, that's a, a subject of discussion right now. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Commissioner Delos. Um, especially since you were following this for the past two and a half years, um, I'm sure you've probably heard some of the types of uses that the community board would like to see. I guess, um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about what you envision, what you are perhaps actively um, seeking for those potential uses and um, what you might be willing to commit to around that. Yeah, you know, um, I think there's been a really long process and a, a really collaborative process at the community board. And as, as Mr. Pariente said, he's attended a lot of the meetings, as have I and as have people um, who we've represented. So um, included in the, 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 I think the one of the key factors that's discussed in this, uh, in this in this area is jobs. And so um, the idea would basically be that the MCRN uses, while retail would be permitted on the ground floor, that you'd come, you'd come away from those uses and go to uses that are more job generating and perhaps uh, at better wages. Use groups three and four are currently included in the MCRN uses. So while the building's proposed build year would be roughly sometime in 2022, so it's um, difficult to actually with any particularity talk to potential tenants. I know that the applicant has talked to, for example, pre-K operators in the site who have, who have said that, that as far as the space is concerned and for contiguous space, that this would be ideal in that regard. So there have been those discussions which have gone, which have gone on. Uh, it's gone to the level of, well, if we needed to satisfy requirements for pre-K, um, how would we provide outdoor space, et cetera. So um, well, again, while there has been nothing definitive and, and definitely nothing memorialized in writing, um, that, that is one of the types of uses which would satisfy both the M Crown uses as presented in the community board's resolutions, as well as um, the applicant's uh, desire to rent the space. Other questions? Thank you to the applicant team. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners. We will follow our standard practice of beginning with speakers in opposition, and our first speaker will be Gib Bacconi. Um, if I may, I'd like to suggest that Chair Tyus uh, represent the community board before me. Great, we'll switch the order. <laughs> Thank you. 
And if I could, before your testimony begins, just thank you on behalf of the department for the work that we have been doing with the community board. It is such a pleasure to work with a community board that has strong leadership and that delivers us resolutions with the degree of detail that really informs our decision making. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Lago. I have to thank my colleague, Gib Vaconi, for the high degree of detail that he's been putting into this work over the years. What we're looking at today goes back to the Crown Heights West rezoning uh, when um, we were unable to include this moribund section of Community Board 8 in that work. So it was left until this point in time when we could get uh, an applicant who would be willing to put in the work that's necessary to uh, do the environmentals. And, and we're lucky to have um, uh, Mr. Von Engel to help us move this project forward. So um, what I would like to remind us today, all of us here, is the support from the Brooklyn Borough President for the um, project that we're looking at now, grant specific. Uh, we need local jobs, and that's one thing that the resolution from the community board wants to put to the forefront. We want people to be able to walk to work and we are looking at that development happen now with the pressure from Atlantic Yard Specific Park, bringing opportunities for small businesses to develop along many lines uh, within that small area rather than have a junkyard or a bus parking lot. So we're grateful that um, this um, recognition by a developer, Periente, that, uh, of what the community board wants to see in its district will uh, move forward with this hearing. So I want to keep my time short. I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Vicconi to give you the detail that you deserve in this stage of the hearing. Appreciate it. Thank you. Actually, if you would have mind, um, I'll check if there are questions from the commission. Yes, Commissioner De La Hose. Um, I, I, first off, th again, thank you for the for the service. I, I know um, have a sense of the amount of time that it takes to put in um, the work that you all have been putting in. Um, on, on the local jobs piece, um, you know, obviously the applicant uh, talked about uh, the potential use groups and, um, and and they mentioned the possibility of, of early childhood. Is is that something that was actively discussed at the community board? Has the community board? I, I mean, I I'm obviously read the resolution, but. Uh, were there, was there more direction, I guess, uh, about the types of jobs um, that, that you all would like to see? We've lingered over that with um, Brooklyn City Planning in detail. Uh, unfortunately, the full board meetings are not a forum where we can drill down to the level that you're asking now. But as chair of the board, I would I have to say, uh, given the success of pre-K uh, by Mayor de Blasio, we would expect that to be repeated. Welcome. Any other questions? Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Tice. Mr. Vic and now, give Bacconi. Uh, thank you very much, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, thanks for the opportunity for speaking this morning. Uh, I think as m most of you are aware, in the summer of 2014, Brooklyn Community Board 8 began a dialogue with the Department of City Planning regarding rezoning an area of Western Crown Heights that's currently zoned M11. Um, in February of 2014, DCP presented to the Community Board a framework for rezoning the district into commercial, industrial, and mixed-use subzones. And in April of last year, we responded, of 18, sorry, we responded with a list of 10 issues to be addressed to align that framework with the M Crown Plan. Um, we met in May of 2018 to discuss these issues, but we're not able to reconvene again with city planning until January of 2019. And at that meeting, we were told that the agency needed more time to respond to some of the issues we had raised um, nine months before. Since then, we've only had one meeting, in point of fact, with city planning, which was in May of 2019. So uh, uh, I very much appreciate the chair's comments about working with the community board, and, and, and we are very committed to this initiative. But in part, we are here today because there's some stakeholder frustration at the perceived lack of action on implementing the M Crown rezoning. Uh, we've received a lot of projected schedules and dates from the agency, but as a community board, we're not left in a position to give a credible answer to property owners about how much longer the rezoning will take. And so owners are taking it upon themselves to submit private ULERP applications like this one. 
So in this case, the density required for the applicant's lot, requested for the applicant's lot, is on the high end of the spectrum for properties on the avenues of the MX subzone in the DCP M crown framework. In this case, the applicant has sought to accommodate the M crown vision for light industrial and arch uses to an extent that would not have been required under the DCP framework. The community board has responded by providing the applicant with an agreement for a binding commitment for M crown uses in 25% of the ground floor area that is both monitorable and enforceable. We've also provided a copy of this agreement to the commission. Uh, if the applicant is willing to abide by it, we would ask that the commission take that into consideration when evaluating this application. In supporting the requested density on the applicant's lot in exchange for a binding commitment, the community board notes that the property abuts the C subzone of the DCP framework where densities and building heights would be greater. Thus, the proposed R7D density would form a transition to potentially lower density corridor along Grand Avenue. Absent a commitment for light industrial use on other lots in the Grand Pacific rezoning, the community board does not support the R7D density on those lots, but recommends their rezoning be limited to R7A C24. We point out that the community board stipulation on ground floor use in exchange for support of this application parallels its protocols for other advisory functions, including recommendations for liquor licenses and review of applications for work on properties in landmark districts. In those cases, other state and city agencies are responsible for enforcing the stipulations. In this case, the board has proposed its own enforcement mechanism where none presently exists. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you for especially effective time management. <laughs> Commissioner Capelli. Did the community board re-vote on this issue? Re-vote on the issue. Yes, Since the time we gave you your resolution? Yes. No, sir. Okay, and wasn't that vote at that time for disapproval with conditions? And, it's, and it is, it remains disapproval with conditions. The conditions are what I spoke to with respect to the agreement that we have provided the applicants. Okay, thank you. Questions. Commissioner Delos. Hi, Gib. Um, on the agreement that you've provided the applicants, um, can you just, obviously also, um, you know, uh, their attorney, Mr. LaBelle, mentioned that they just received it. Can you kind of characterize the status of those discussions and when you think or when you hope they might wrap up? Yeah, in fairness to the applicants, they received that agreement earlier in the week. Um, it was a little bit of doing, putting it together. It took a lot of discussions with some subject matter experts and, and, and legal consultation. So I, I, I didn't come here today expecting the applicants to be able to respond to it in full. But um, essentially, the, the, the pieces of it are that um, there will be a restricted de declaration filed for the property that reserves 25% of the ground floor for mandated M crown uses as specified in the community board's resolution. The community board will have the right to inspect the, uh, the area um, periodically and um, in the event that there's non-compliance with those uses, we'll have the ability to assess, um, uh, to assess remedies to the owner um, such remedies to be used to further industrial and light industrial and arts uses in um, Brooklyn Community District 8. Uh, the agreement also provides some, some restrictions on transfers to ensure that future owners also abide with the same set of conditions for use on the property and also um, allow for inspection. Um, and it also provides for uh, an obligation to keep that 25% of the ground floor occupied, uh, it may not remain vacant. Um, so that's, the, that, that's sort of a general outline, but the commission does have a copy of the agreement. Um, it, it, and so you, you can refer to that. I get the sense we're talking to the drafter of the agreement. <laughs> you, you would be correct in that assumption. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Vela is. Uh, so as follow up to that, um, first off, I just wanna say, um, it's uh, pretty extraordinary that, that you've uh, laid this out and quite honestly that the community board is um, willing and I hope able uh, to follow through on all of those things. That's, that's a lot for a community board to take on. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, some capacity is built into that process so that you, the enforcement can actually happen if, if, if this were to move forward. Um, uh, you know, you asked us to take into consideration um, their willingness to engage in this. Um, so there might be a timing issue here with that request, um, which, you know, some of us 
it's technically outside our purview, I think, as you know, um, but I certainly appreciate what's going on. Um, so it would be helpful uh, to keep the, um, you know, to keep us um, as part of the review session and the staff uh, up to date about what the status of things so that before we vote, we have a clear understanding of where things stand. Uh, we would be happy to do that. And I appreciate the comments about the community board's um, proactivity here. Uh, we are doing, we're very well aware, we're doing something that's unusual for a community board in Brooklyn. Community boards in Brooklyn typically are not going out and requesting residential upzonings. Um, in this case, we believe that the future of the area in terms of its ability to provide jobs really rests on economic viability that will be provided through the use of residential development. Um, so we've tried to find a way to move forward in that direction, but still provide some uh, confidence that the jobs will will come as well. With, with respect to the um, uh, the burden of enforcing it, it's 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 not our preference that the community board be involved with this. We would rather see the neighborhood rezoning complete. We would rather see that mechanism be something that is. Um, administered by the city, as I believe is contemplated in uh, the Gowanus rezoning. Um, but in the absence of that, we have spoken to other um, community partners who are in a position to potentially help with some of the enforcement tasks and have demonstrated an interest in that. So we, we have begun that process as well. Other questions? Thank, Thank you, you both very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Liddell York. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Lago and members of the commission. My name is Liddell York. I am a security officer and I have been a member of SEIU 32BJ for three years. I'm here today on behalf of my union 32BJ and more, of the, more than 3,032 BJ members who live and work in Community District 8. As you know, our members clean, maintain, and secure residential buildings like 98 Pacific Street. We believe that in order to create a more equitable New York, developers should commit to provide and prevailing wage building service jobs. Historically, these jobs have allowed working families from diverse backgrounds, upward mobility, and security. Good jobs that pay the prevailing wage are imperative for working people to sustain life in New York City. We estimate that this development will create about five per property service jobs. These jobs should help uplift working families and give workers dignity. We are happy to report that the development for this project has made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage building service jobs at this site, and we respectfully request that you approve this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. York. Questions? Those are the only speakers who have signed up on this matter. If anyone else is interested in testifying, please come forward. The public hearing is closed. 32, Borough of Brooklyn, Community District 13. Unit number C. 190172ZMK, a public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning 271 Seabreeze Avenue. Hello. Hello, good morning, Commissioners and Madam Chair. Uh, happy to be here in 2020 and happy to be here with a great application for you. Uh, it's an application for a rezoning at 271 Seabreeze Avenue, which is directly across the street from Astor Levy Park, which is a gem that's in the process of uh, undergoing substantial investment. And I'll just click right through here to give you an aerial of it. Uh, the site you could see here is in the middle. It's labeled site. Uh, it's got an R6 zoning designation on it. It's proposed to encompass the property with a C24 commercial overlay. Overlay. It would extend from block to block, from West 5th, which is on the left, to West 2nd, that is on the right, but it will truly uh, just be facilitating this development, which is proposed to have ground floor commercial uses that are going to be comprised of things that you can't buy on Amazon, and it's also proposed to have a spa at the second floor, and then some community facility at the third floor, and then there's residential proposed above, and the building is under construction right now. It's 
stories and some of the pictures I'm gonna show you because nobody has an aerial of it up in the air, but we have some pictures from the ground. Uh, so it has been started, the construction, but not with any ground floor commercial. It's been started with an as of right uh, filed at the Department of Buildings for parking at the lower floors uh, and community facility space with the hopes that if this application were to be approved, we would then convert the commercial space. We should also note that it's been designed with the input of your Brooklyn office, which I'll show you in a moment, includes on the Asher Levy side of the development, a plaza area that was not required by zoning, but was the input of the uh, borough office, and that's reflected in the building that's under construction, even though it hasn't been acted on yet by your uh, commission. This just gives you uh, more of an aerial of the of the properties around you, as you could see, uh, the playgrounds and Asher Levy Park, and my favorite, the New York Aquarium. Uh, we click right through here. This starts to give you an idea of the building that's under construction that I was speaking to a moment ago. You could see, obviously, it's the building that's uh, in Wisconsin, the scaffolding. Uh, this just gives you more views of it as you go around. Uh, you could see the, perhaps what you're seeing, the most important part as you're, you're going around, is you see the West Brighton side, you could see the elevated rail. Uh, that's something that was uh, very important, that we treated this side of the building aesthetically, and you'll see more in the pictures I'm gonna show you of the building as it's proposed to be built, uh, is the aesthetic that your uh, urban design uh, team has put into the development, and uh, you'll see the results of their work. Here you can see the maps. This shows you the overlay itself that we're proposing in the striped area. Uh, this map shows you the zoning map, sectional side by side. Very simple what we're proposing as far as the overlay goes. Uh, this again just gives you the overlay. Uh, here you can start to see a little bit about what I was talking about. I think you should be interested in at least is the plaza area. What you're looking at right now is the Asher Levy side of the, of the development. And you can see there's a plaza that's not required by zoning, not required by the commercial overlay. But it, what did come up during the discussions with your uh, with uh, your urban design team. Uh, this is what is permitted by Department of Buildings under current zoning. This is what's under construction at the Department of Buildings uh, on their pr approved plans. Uh, this shows you uh, the parking at the ground floor. That's what's allowable. Uh, there is no commercial overlay right now. Again, this shows you what was allowed. This is all allowable stuff. This is what we want to build. This is what we are building. Uh, again, the setback at the first floor, I can't say it enough. None of this is required by the commercial overlay, but it was really a good idea. And the developers here today, uh, Ryback Development, has done this at the El Greco site uh, in Sheepshead Bay, which is uh, another action by your staff level, which has really uh, transformed Sheepshead Bay. If you haven't had a chance to be at this old El Greco diner site, you should see the plaza they built there. And it's really become a hub of Sheepshead Bay right on the water. Uh, it's the same developer. So this gives you an idea of the West Brighton side. Oh, I'm out of time, but you start to get the gist of the development, as you can Thank see you. here. Uh, it's all about the ground Thanks, floor and Mr. commercial. Plotting. Thank you. Commissioner Dweck. Question. Can, can you, uh, hi, Eric. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Can you speak to some of the borough president's recommendations uh, about the car share uh, and some other recommendations? That and, uh, and also, can you speak about a, uh, a set aside for a cultural space? And there's some rumors that there might be one coming in, or there's some yes, talk. there's. Uh, speak to those rumors. I'd be happy to. So the. the Everything, nothing is confirmed yet, but the developer I mentioned is here today has been actively engaged in discussions with both the council person and local businesses to put some type of cultural uses uh, within the space, whether it be something related uh, to some type of not-for-profits uh, that are active in the area. There has been some discussion about dedicating and setting aside some space at either a market or a below market rent uh, to accommodate the, those uses there. Uh, but there's also been talk about car sharing at the community board, uh, somebody spoke up about the need for car sharing in the area, and the developer is anxious to do that. We are providing more parking spaces than we're required to have right now, as you call out to. Uh, required to have 118 spaces, we're providing 130. Uh, so that was all came up at the borough president's level. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Polotnik. Thank you very much. And that is the only speaker on this item. And as usual, if anyone is interested in speaking, now's the time to come forward. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Put another card. Oh, I did in not opposition. see. I'm afraid I. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have another speaker. Apologies, Ms. Rose. Rhonda Rose. Just, Madam Chair, I was. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the uh, developer is here today. Is he signed up to speak or? Has not. Has not signed up. To speak. Good morning, commissioners, chair, vice chair. Um, this block, block 7280, is a remaining parcel from 
uh, Fred Trump's um, building of uh, Trump Village in South Brooklyn. Uh, this, uh, on the other side of the elevated train tracks are the, um, are the uh, co-ops that he built, and to the side of that are the rentals that were built. But this uh, block was for community uses. So uh, the block has a, the Trump Village parking lot, and it has a uh, synagogue, and it had um, the Jewish World War II Veterans Hall with a baseball field. This building is on the site of the former baseball field. Um, what uh, is being proposed here is like a Trump Tower. We have, we're going to see this very tall architectural presence in Coney Island. And at the bottom of this architectural presence will be retail, catering to cars. If you look at what's happening on, um, at the SCID, the Special Coney Island District, begins three blocks from the site. The first commercial development there is going to be a Starbucks drive through because people drive cars in this part of Brooklyn. 271 Seabreeze will be no different. People will drive cars there. Um, the West Brighton Avenue's role in Coney Island is to be a through street, not a choke point, which it will become. Um, I'm requesting not to overturn the R6 zoning, which protects the, um, the residents as well as the future of the Special Coney Island District. There is a million square feet of new retail being built in the area, 500,000 square feet in the Special Coney Island District. Most of it is under construction. We are look, you are looking for tenants for those storefronts. In addition, you have Ruben Schrand, who has taken over the whole area bordering Coney Island and Gravesend and into Brighton Beach. And he has also uh, empty storefronts, but mostly, you know, he's, he's filled things that were, not, uh, that were not available before. Thank okay. you, Ms. Rose. Questions? Commissioner Delos. Uh, Ms. Rose, first, thanks for ma making the trek um, to Lower Manhattan uh, for the hearing. Appreciate that. You seem to be someone who is very familiar with a number of things that are going on in the community. Um, can you? Are you affiliated with the community board? Can you kind of like talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, your background as as part of this, and uh, and then I, it sounds as though the main concern. Uh, is about density and traffic. Is, is that correct? Is, are there any other one or two other primary concerns that you have? Okay. Um, my, my primary concern is the, I am not a member of the community board. I came to the community board because I'm very concerned about climate change. And I don't see enough going on. And I went there to ask what's happening. And I found out about this development, which I had questions about. So I'm really concerned about the, the lack of a climate change culture in this area, and that um, fingers are being pointed to us that we need a culture shift. And um, I just don't think that this project is a reflection of that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you again, Ms. Rose. Okay. Yeah. Is there more speakers on this? No. Oh. So I was just going to comment that I was under the impression that the developer was going to speak, but and I was going to query him about the non-for-profit uh, culture institution discussions. Mm -hmm. So if possible, if we can get some follow-up in, in, in a letter or in yeah. writing. Yeah. We would ask Mr. Palotnik as the representative if you could get us follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Okay. Public hearing is closed.
calendar number 33, Borough of Brooklyn, Community District 10, ULIP number C190295 ZMQ, a public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning 8118 13th Avenue rezoning. Our first speaker will be Richard Lobel. Welcome back. Thank you, good to be back. <coughs> Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel for the record. Chair, commissioners, this is the 8118 13th Avenue rezoning. This rezoning is in community board 10 in Brooklyn. And the building that you see in front of you uh, has a zoning history, which is interesting. It originally was the subject of a BSA variance in 1955. This was a variance which resulted in the current iteration of the building, which is a 2,875 square foot building on a 4,000 square foot lot. The, at the time, the district uh, around the property, and this is prior to 1961, was a retail use district. The re, the uh, variance at the time allowed for an enlargement uh, in violation of lot coverage requirements. So uh, for years, the building, which was built in the 1950s, was operated as the Stars and Stripes Democratic Club. Uh, and at some point, uh, probably about 30 years ago, um, the applicant uh, began using it for a for legal offices, law offices. Um, the law offices now uh, are uh, not only for the applicant, but also there are about five or six other attorneys who maintain office space at this site. So upon review, despite the longstanding existence of the building as a as a club, a non-commercial club, the technical use as a legal office is not permitted uh, pursuant to the zoning. The zoning, as you can see here, is an R5B uh, district is the rezoning that sought is for an R5B with a C13 overlay. Um, this is um, a, a contextual re a rezoning which appreciates the context of 13th Avenue in that this property in a string of 17 blocks on the western side of 13th Avenue is the only block without a C13 overlay. So we've got 16 blocks on the western portion of 13th Avenue with commercial overlays, this one being the only one that was left absent. So the rezoning zoning here would in, would in essence allow uses uh, at the property, specifically office use and commercial uses generally that would respect the commercial nature of this corridor. I'd also note, as you can see from the land use map, that there are commercial uses all along 13th Avenue in this area, uh, including a commercial overlay or overlays on the eastern side of 13th Avenue extending uh, 12 blocks. So I think for these reasons and for the commercial context of this corridor, um, the community board was very comfortable with this rezoning, approved it uh, pursuant to a vote of 37 in favor, zero against, one abstaining, and we were able also to achieve uh, an approval at the Brooklyn Borough President's Office. Again, from the uh, zoning change map, you can see the change here is very minor. Uh, it involves a total of three lots, including the applicant owned lot and two lots to the south of the applicant's own lot, which housed two two-story residential buildings, which pursuant to the EAS are not projected to be development sites. Uh, you can see from pictures, again, the nature of the surrounding area, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions. Questions from the commission? You're off the hook. Fantastic, thank you, Chair. Commissioners, have a great day. And this time I am correct in saying that no one else has signed up to speak on this matter, but if anyone is interested, now would be the time to come forward. So the public hearing is closed. Calendar number 34, Borough of Queens, Community District 2. You look number N190352 ZRK, a public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning text amendment concerning the Queens Boulevard MIH text amendment. Chair, I'm recused on this matter. Thank you, Commissioner Ron Prashad. Our first speaker is Frank St. Jacques. Good morning, Chair Largo and Commissioners. Uh, Frank St. Jacques of Ackerman LLP for the applicant. Uh, I'll note that members of the community have submitted written testimony in lieu of speaking today. Um, There are two project areas for this application located about a half mile from one another on Queens Boulevard and Community District 2. This portion of Queens Boulevard is zoned R7X C23 and is in an inclusionary housing designate, designated area. This application seeks to establish mandatory inclusionary housing areas within the two project areas. The land use rationale is to produce more income restricted housing. The current R7X zoning permits a base FAR of 3.75 and can be increased to 5.0 with the provision of income-restricted housing under the voluntary program. 
under MIH, the maximum FAR would increase to six FAR. However, the maximum building height would remain the same under the uh, as under the voluntary program at 14 stories or 145 feet. Under MIH, uh, a 25 to 30% set aside as required versus 20% under the voluntary program. The uh, proposed zoning text amendment uh, would facilitate on development site one, uh, a 13 story building with 140 units, uh, 42 of which would be permanently income restricted uh, under MIH option two. Uh, the unit breakdown is uh, about 43% studios, 2% one bedroom, 46% two bedroom, and 9% three bedroom. And the proposed action on would facilitate on the uh, second development site, a 12-story building with 78 units, 23 of which would be permanently income restricted. Uh, the unit breakdown there is 13% uh, studios, 24% one bedrooms, 49% two bedrooms, and 14% three bedrooms. The site plan. Um, Hannock has been selected as the Affordable Housing Administering Agent. Um, a representative is, is here from, from Hannock, uh, if needed, to answer any questions. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you. Questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jorge Ortiz. Good morning, members. My name is Jorge Ortiz. I'm a former and I have been a member for 32 BJ for 46 years. I'm here today on behalf of my union of the 3,000 members who live and work in the community district number two. We are pleased to tell you that the development for this project has made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage up to the future property service working at this site. 32 BJ sees as example or responsible for development, private de develop, development that include MIH, it's important to create a more, a more equipped New York. We believe that the development team has a vision to invest in this community, and we are happy to support this plan. We respectfully request you approve this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ortiz. Thank Questions? You. Thank you. Those are all of the speakers that have signed up, and if anyone else is interested in speaking, now would be the time. The public hearing is closed. And Mr. Secretary, any other business? Uh, there is not. Okay, the meeting is over. Thank you.